Hello and welcome to The Good, The Scars and The Rugby. Uh, Scars and I are at home this week in Twickenham and Leicestershire respectively after a busy weekend in Wales. Uh, the Red Roses ran riot in a dominant second half against Wales, but the Welsh girls did put up a very good fight, something to be proud of in that first half. Ireland lost out to Italy and Palmer and managed to stay within a converted try for the first half and Scotland were nilled by a very commanding French side. So uh, another weekend of no upsets unless, unless you count Skaz's dad who did get upset because I was trying to distract her from her TV, TV work and Mark Scarrett came over and said, hi, I'm Skaz's dad, don't distract her. Bless him. Is he like your security? Yeah, 100%. It's because they always stand behind us and start like waving. And I'm like, I've seen you. I've seen you. Bless them. No, they were, it was great for, to see them. It was lush that they're there. They, they love supporting the girls, obviously, even though I'm not playing. Um, and I, I, we were stood on the side of the pitch doing our thing. And then I, at the corner of my eye, I saw these two worlds colliding. You guys and my parents. And I was like, shoo-lulu. I was like, what do I do? <laughs> There's nothing I could do or say. It was just happening. We were live on air. And I thought, what's the worst that could happen? Well, and the worst thing that could happen is your dad getting stuck into the beer pong. But he was holding fast. Um, so Reading Abbey was there. They were incredibly loud. Very vocal fans. Great to see them. Tons of vibe and energy. Um, and they were carrying a rugby ball beer pong. But Mr. Scarrett was having none of it. It was a funnel. Funnel. That thing. Yeah. So again... After I saw you guys, uh, this was way after the game, we were still on air and this you could see this group of, they were quite clearly on tour because they were all in their gear, like matching shirts and they started chanting like, Emily Scarrett, give us a wave, give them a little wave. And then again, we were on air and then out of the corner of my eye, I see them like calling my dad over and I was like, one, how do they even know is my dad? And then two, they're just like, trying to throw this funnel in his face. And I was like, oh my goodness. Obviously he's trying to stay professional. And then I looked at my mum and my mum's basically like, don't you dare. <laughs> so I got stuck into my dad afterwards. So I was like, I can't believe you're so, that's really disappointing. You disappointed me there. You let me down. I thought you were better than that. I thought you'd thought you'd give the funnel a go. <laughs> he wasn't happy. And then the mascot who walked out with the Welsh girls, Hannah, uh, we caught up with her and her dad pre and post the event and so many warm fuzzies. If you haven't seen the video, go look it up on our socials. Um, absolutely there for the atmosphere. The 8,862 people in that stadium, a record crowd um, and a Welsh first half performance that absolutely rewarded and encouraged those fans because they were incredibly loud on the opposite side in the sunshine there. Yeah, it was class. Um, I've definitely never been in, a, in an away environment kind of in the home nations like that. Obviously, you get it in France, but not not somewhere like Wales. Um, it was awesome. Just the colours, for one, the reds, obviously everywhere. It was awesome. The Welsh choir, the I thought the anthem was awesome, um, led by the choir. Um, I had one of the TV guys stood next to me and he had this amazing, deep almost like operatic voices and he was just belting it out so it was it, yeah the whole thing was awesome but yeah so good to see that many fans and like obviously the game turned in its second half and England kind of ran away with it but nobody left nobody kind of got you know their demeanor or their noise didn't change at all throughout that obviously tougher period for Wales and I love that because I do think the, fa the fans in the women get, women's game are different and they get behind it kind of irrelevant which I love. Some of my favorite moments of the game uh, were when I stood next to the England, um, could, could I say dugout, the bench area, because um, our bestie Mo was carrying the tea and I was trying to get her attention and she ignored me so comprehensively <laughs> that Ellie Kildun ran up at one point and pointed to us and tugged at her sleeve. And then she gave me the stare and basically said, leave it alone. <laughs> but we did get to Mo after the game. <laughs> you thought I was going to do an interview mid-match. Honestly, when I saw you there with your little mic, I was like, no. Come on. <laughs> I'd have loved to, but I'd have been shot and never been allowed to do anything responsible again. Tell me about your tea-carrying duties. Were you putting in a player of the match performance today? Do you know what? I think that the fact that the girls had that energy towards the end, <laughs> the fueling that happened <laughs> on pitch, 
<laughs> Simply sublime. <laughs> it was all in the team. No, no, not at all. The girls were amazing. Like they've prepped so well, and it, it, like they were just smiling like 60 in. You can see they weren't even tired. They were just so up for it, and it was amazing to watch. Glad to be pitch side for it. How are the feelings about Twickenham? Because today was noisy. Yeah. Today was loud, and you could see people had to run over to one another <laughs> to give messages. Yeah. Twickenham's going to be a lot louder. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I said to Zoe the other day, I was like, we need to start using our like our hand signals as our calls and stuff like that. So yeah, it will be. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be really cool. And obviously home support as well. I think there was quite a lot of home support here, but typically English, you didn't really hear them that much. You only heard the Welsh in the crowd. So to be at Twickenham would be sick. Fifty thousand people. That's more than. I mean. That's literally more than any any woman has played in front of, right? Well, yeah, it's going to set a world record, isn't it? So it's got to be um, um, unreal. I mean, and what, we're still two weeks out, two weeks out, just less than if we're being picky. But yeah, how mad? I mean, oh, again, I think I think that last week sales, hopefully, obviously, this weekend goes well for England, get a good victory against Ireland. France do the same in their game, and then it is literally, you can sell it as Six Nations final. Well, our Le Crunch avec Branch, did I say that right? The right way around. Sometimes I, in my head it goes Le Branch avec Crunch, but then that's not the same thing. Um, our live show at the Cabbage Patch. You might be doing something different. <laughs> um, <laughs> someone's going to get crunched one way or another. <laughs> uh, the Cabbage Patch before uh, England, France in two weeks' time. Um, we cannot get over this. It's sold out in two hours. Um, and we promise we will do more events in future if you missed out this time. There are other people who are also doing tons of events in the area. I'm loving to see the level at which the community is activating around this. Um, and then the other thing that we need to talk about is this phenomenal post-match that Mo did with Marley Packer, where she gave us the not so BBC answer <laughs> and this is why people listen to the pod. How are you feeling? Yeah, great. Like I'm super proud of the girls. Obviously not ideal for Hey, it's me. It's oh, not sorry. your interview. <laughs> right. How are you really feeling? Uh, yeah, good. Like I could do with um, a day off tomorrow and I can't <laughs> wait for it to be fair. Um, but yeah, like it was nice to get a ten minute break, but hey ho. No it wasn't. You hated that. She's lying. She's lying. What happened to your shirt? Well, I lost it, didn't I? And I haven't got the body for my shirt to come off mid-game to 8,000 people. So I was like, oh. It's not that. them. It's not them. It's the cameras that picked it up. I know. And then there was another time I was on the bench and I was pulling out a front wedgie, maybe. And that was on the main camera as well. I was like, what are you doing to me? I'm getting mugged right off today. But yeah. Hey, look. Great game. Great game. Yeah. Happy with it? Yeah. Like, I'm frustrated with my own performance, but as a group, look. They brought it to us and like we knew they were going to around the breakdown but you know they did get under my skin in the first 10 minutes there was a little bit it holding on the extras yeah they knew exactly what they were doing but you know when you put a performance in like that as a squad and put that many points on a team you know we they talk about growing the gap but we're growing the gap further all right job see you later boys see you later. Thank you. You. Bye. just getting her out <laughs> so that's molly packet just chucking the bombs in there towards the end it's so funny. When I saw her after the game, I obviously gave her a hug. They're two of the first things she said to me. She's like, the camera was on me when I was pulling the front wedgie out and uh, my shirt came off and my tummy was hanging out. I was like, I didn't, I didn't see either of them, but that, that's always her first concern, bless her. But yeah, it's very funny. I love the fact that Mo calls her out after five words on, this is not an interview, please don't give me your, like you say, your BBC answer. <laughs> Yeah, the PC one. Um, yeah. My most memorable bit of that entire conversation is they say they're narrowing the gap, but we just keep growing it further. Uh, now, before we welcome our brilliant guest, our good friends at Honda have asked us to give a one-word review of the weekend's action. Um, Skaz, have you got a piece of paper there with your one-word review ready? It's ready to go. Okay, you go first. So I've kind of copied... So anyone who listens to the boys' podcast... I've copied one of Shane Horgan's ones that he did because I feel like it's appropriate for this week. And I've gone... Can you see that? Ooh. Come back a bit. That is, Confirmation. That is a word. It's a long word. I don't know if the shot's wide enough to get it all in. I started a bit big and I actually had to write it twice because I realised that the shun at the end was going to be <laughs> tiny. <laughs> but anyway, 
the reason I wrote confirmation, similar to his reasons that he gave, I feel like, you know, we were unsure as to, not unsure, but we knew Wales had made loads of progress and we thought this game could be a really, you know, telling one. And I think it was, I think it definitely showed that they have improved, but I think it also shows that England are just still too strong at the moment. I think similar in the other games, Again, we've spoken about Ireland and I know we'll speak far more about them, but probably confirmed where they are at against an Italian side who, yes, beat them, but I think are also on their own path a little bit at the moment, probably haven't pushed on as much as we might have thought kind of a couple of years ago, etc. Again, France confirmed they're too strong at the moment for, for some of the other nations. And again, Scotland, a bit similar as well, have improved, but just haven't, you know, not able to, to get on the scoreboard in terms of tries etc against that French side so yeah I went confirmation what have you got for night nice. see I that's basically the same thing but yours is three letters and mine's about 15. I'm all about keeping it nice and tight but this is also the word that Molly Packer used uh, they say they're narrowing the gap we'll just keep growing it but I think the thing is that there is a narrowing and the gap really is the thing that we're focusing on that's the thing we're all watching and in the first half between Wales and England there wasn't much of a gap. I think professionalism will be the thing that will allow teams like Wales to keep in touch for a much bigger chunk of the game and that's probably the truth across the board between all of these teams or between all of the teams involved in all of these matches that we saw over the weekend. So, um, we might as well then welcome our guest on the topic of gaps. It's been a big week for Irish rugby. The RFU have come under a lot of criticism over the last few years. They didn't qualify for Rugby World Cup 2021. Last week, The Telegraph published a damning investigation into sexism at the Union, um, specifically towards the women's team, and the men's team has just won a Grand Slam on St. Patrick's Day, and they rank number one in the world going into a Rugby World Cup campaign. So there is proof of concept. Ireland knows how to breed winning teams. It's in the culture. It's in the fibre. It's part of how they can operate in rugby. The Red Roses will travel to Ireland this weekend across the Irish Sea. So to take a look at Irish rugby as it is now with us is Lynn Cantwell, Ireland's Grand Slam winning vice captain, the most capped Irish women's player of all time. She's played in four Rugby World Cups, one Rugby World Cup sevens tournament, one touch World Cup. And she was part of the first Irish team to beat New Zealand in the 2015 Rugby World Cup in France. Uh, also sits on the executive board of Sport Ireland and is chair of Sport Ireland's Women in Sport Committee. More importantly, though, these days she spends a lot of time with my people in South Africa, working as the Women's High Performance Manager at uh, SA Rugby. Uh, she took the women box to the World Cup and is facing a tough battle. This isn't something she said, I'm saying it, because as much as South Africa loves rugby, they seemingly don't love women playing it nearly as much. And there's a massive gulf there between the men's and the women's game. 2019 Rugby World Cup defending champions in the spring box, women box ranked 12th. Um, so there is a lot of work to do and she went from one green team to another. Uh, we'll just keep her in the green if we can. You're in Ireland at the moment, right, Lynn? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks, girls, for having me. How's your bry skills coming along, if you had to write yourself? Oh, my goodness. Like, Emma, I have just... It's been a whirlwind of experiences, but definitely at a culinary level, I have just been dropped into my nightmare. Like, I, I am a bad cook, you know. I'm definitely a functional... <laughs> person and cook I don't know about you Emily but you know when it comes to food I just fuel and I've always just like fueled my whole life and then when I retired and you realize oh god and then if you had kids you realize oh I have to be responsible and learn some new like things about food and then you go to South Africa and everybody is just such an expert on food and how to cook and how long you cook and we got invited to our first ever braai and we made the you know the school girl school girl error of arriving being told to arrive at 2 p.m and we arrived at 2 p.m expecting to eat at 3 p.m and then at 7 p.m we were like oh my god i'm so hungry because they're marinating this and they're cooking that and that'll take three hours and you know while you're salivating waiting for this <laughs> meat that you can see beside the bride to be put on the bride so we can eat it um 
but yeah, no, I've I've learned a lot. I've not tried to uh, learn how to cook meat properly at all because I could never compete with South Africans. But exceptional hosts, and it's the far the furthest that I got was to buy some like hosting dishes and side dishes. There's different colors for different dishes and everybody's very good hosts and I'm not at all. I usually, when I invite people over, I know that's not what the podcast is about. When I invite people over, I always send them a text, like an apologetic text in advance to say, I'm so sorry, like you'll probably get, you know, Woolworth's lasagna. You know, you definitely won't get a braai. But uh, anyway, long story short, very, very impressed with braai skills. And it hasn't passed on to me at all, unfortunately. South Africa sounds like my heaven. It's literally just, it's the, it's home, <laughs> entertaining at home is literally, we don't go to pubs. We don't go to neutral territory. If I'm going to see you, you're coming to my house and we will be eating. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's um, exceptional. I've actually learned so much from a hosting point of view. And like, Emily, if you like hosting or food and detail and stuff it's a, it's a fabulous place to be wow it's next level it's more the food bit i can give or take the hosting but definitely the food bit i'm not a, I, I get the food for fuel bit but i'm a full food for enjoyment kind of girl ah uh, yes yes i wish i aspire to be you so you're working with um with rassi erasmus one of the most polarizing people in all of the world of rugby these days do you get a lot of people asking you about that is that something that your Irish mates and family members are secretly a little curious about? Yeah, you definitely do. I, I think some people don't ask because they, you know, it's such an interesting topic and they don't want to intrude. Um, but, you know, it's on the tip of their tongues. And then some people do ask. And to be fair, my experience of Rassi has been very, very positive. You know, he's he's hugely pro and supportive of the women's game. You know, he is a he is a very progressive thinker um, and liberal type of person, isn't he? And and that's the type of person that matches well with what we need in the women's game and so on. Um, so I, he's always been very supportive of me. You know, like I think it's probably best not to comment on the the other dynamics and so on. Uh, and and look, I think there's complications in all of those debates and um, topics in the men's game, isn't there? Uh, but but yeah, look, it's definitely been an animated time in my time there uh, under Rassi as as my boss. But yeah. So Rassi Erasmus is your boss. What does being the high performance manager um, for the women's game in South Africa mean you do on a daily basis now? My job is formally to drive performance at a national level. So what that means, I'm responsible <clears throat> for all the national teams. That's the sevens and fifteens, technically the juniors. Like symptomatic of every women's system is usually you'll go into a system and there's 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 a an infrastructure build, there's a capacity build in staffing. You know, so we actually only have three soon to be four staff in the women's rugby department and as a result if, if I just focused on the national teams we we wouldn't move as fast as we need to so I think when I came in originally obviously you scope out the whole thing and you realize that pipelines are are like really important and the pipeline build in South Africa in such a vast country um, and such a range of development at different provinces <clears throat> there was a, a big job to try and undertake how do we scope out what we do from a pipeline point of view so like part of that was to try and employ a, a pathways lead which we did after about six months so um so that's great Tavisa Kula works with me she's a former Springbok herself Springbok captain actually herself and uh, she's wonderful and, and we have a team that is trying to work on that but formally my time should be spent with the national teams and in particular this year for example our sevens team has gone into a full-time block. So they're kind of in Stellenbosch every day, obviously training our, our national 15s team. We're, you know, we're trying to align with all of the, um, well, not that we're trying to align with all of the, the other countries in the world, is that all of the countries in the world are trying to align to have two competition windows whereby our 15s are, are, are getting competitive games <clears throat> and tests around that March, April window. And then around that uh, October, November window, window, which will be WX 15s. So from a 15s point of view, we've been mega busy trying to um, continue the momentum, momentum from the, the 2022 World Cup, uh, which we've only just finished. Obviously, we played in, in Spain in those couple of tests and the girls go back now to their provinces, compete in the premier competition. And then we'll obviously prep for the second competition window. So a lot of my time is spent in national camp. Um, 
at the same time, I think a success of my role is trying to find the right balance between being with the national teams and 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 working strategically, in particular with the with the provinces. Um, you know, I'm sure lots of other countries are doing it, but you know, we've we've scoped out a a roadmap to professionalism for the elite game, and you know what that means. Obviously, similar to what has happened with the Alliance League for the past six years, around how do we engage with all the provinces to to drive minimum standards and um on the elite game. So that's another kind of big part of my role. Um, but then I suppose the kind of the women's sport and rugby, women's rugby romantic, in you w- won't allow me not to try and push, even though we haven't got the capacity to do it, but you know, female coaches and female referees and um, athlete welfare and all these other things. But if if we can build a team to have more people in it that can do all of these things, then that'd be an awful lot easier for on me. But at the moment, I kind of juggle a, a good bit of that. Genuinely, when you took this job, there was a part of my heart that broke for you because I realized, I, obviously, I, I have a bit more intel on what the structures look like and the lack thereof, but also the mammoth task that you were taking on. What is it that is unique? Is there anything that has surprised you? Obviously, going into it, you knew that there was a a massive gap there. Uh, But what is it that has maybe been more... uh, more intense than you expected it to be um yeah and I think that's why I was really looking forward to this conversation you know it's really it's it's really lovely to um speak to people about the women's game through a South African context you know and I think what I learned in you know going to South Africa is that um you know, there's very different landscapes of of versions of sport out there and opportunity and obviously in South Africa opportunity is is a lot harder to come by for when you know for when you're coming from from Ireland or the UK or a first world country for example so that's why I was really looking forward to this conversation and then from Emily's point of view I know she's quite really thoughtful and I'm really interested to hear her impression of of what she's hearing and, and what she's seeing as well I think that the positives is that I think South Africa is such a rugby mad country and I think what I've been so pleasantly surprised in is that there is it's actually easy it's actually quite easy to get people on board um you'll always have the people who just don't like women's rugby and and there's plenty of them but it's quite easy to convert people i think one really privileged thing that i've learned uh has been that it feels like and i could be wrong elma this is just my my observation but it feels like kind of at a, at a transformational level south africa are so far down their their journey of kind of societal transformation and um, that they truly understand inequity and um, so when we talk about gender it's already like oh well, of course you know of course you know our sport doesn't reflect the reality of society and of course that needs to change so that's actually been quite impressive whereas I feel sometimes in Ireland or the UK or Europe you're trying to convince people that the women's game isn't equally treated to the men's game and they get on board just because, you know, they think it's the right thing to do, but they don't really, really understand. You know, they really still don't understand that the game of rugby is obviously designed by and for men, which none of us are complaining about. That's reality. Like, you know, it's 120 years old. The women's game is only 40. Um, but but they don't really understand that piece, you know, whereas I, I, I believe that in South Africa, um, that, that inequity conversation is, is quite is quite easy to explain. Um, the intensity piece, I suppose, what I didn't expect is the range of opportunity and, and difficulty and challenge of, of some of the girls. You know, I, I didn't expect that a large proportion of our planning from a reality point of view is comes down to, to basics. You know, we, we really we'd actually do have to we have to <clears throat> factor into our planning transport, you know, to ensure girls get to training safe and back uh, that they can get to training, things like that. So, you know. In an elite lens, we we need to create training environments and daily training environments and performance environments and all of the component parts to that that are necessary to kind of map towards high performance. Um, But, you know, in in other countries, you'd be talking about, and and as we all are, is how do we attract experienced coaches into the game to really drive technical, tactical competency, you know, elite S&C, medical, etc. But what we don't counter for is, you know, those girls need to actually get training. So um, I think that's something that I that I hadn't factored for um, and and that can be quite intense um, 
And then it's trying to find, for me, I think it's trying to find the right balance between how do we support our players to to journey uh, to understand professional sport and what that entails. Some of it is mindset and you just being tough and conditioning yourself to be able to kind of train really, really hard and that be so intense and the sacrifices that you have to give. And, and also then how much do we have to understand what is in some girl's way um, and what do we need to do to intervene to get those things out of your way so you can train hard and try and reach your potential. Do you know the crazy thing is when, um, and I don't think Babola will mind me tell, telling the story, but she plays at Quinn's now. And when we filmed an interview with her for World Rugby in March 2021, uh, we were robbed and we were sitting, uh, we were on our way to the police station. We were robbed just outside of her house and we were on our way to the police station to go uh, get a case number and report um, the robbery. And in the car, Richard and I, on the way there in the morning, had bought two coffees and two of those massive oat cookies the ones that are the size of your face um <laughs> because we didn't really plan for breakfast and i'd never had mine or he didn't have his and in the car i offered babalwa a cookie and said aren't you hungry and she said yeah and i passed her the cookie and it was this massive thing and then we were sitting at the police station she said she said this one was really good where did you buy it and i said no we got it at just the petrol station actually she said oh okay she'll maybe look out for it and i said half kind of almost flippantly, you must literally eat every cent you earn. And she said, you have no idea how true that is. And when the CEO of Whisper, the company that we were filming it for, wanted to send her a bunch of flowers to say sorry about the robbery happening, I said to them, can we please not send this woman flowers? And reached out to um, a protein a company that makes protein products and said, can you just give me the biggest hamper of protein products that I can send this girl? <laughs> because flowers in her context are just ridiculous. It is a ridiculous gift to try and give someone when they are literally eating every cent they earn. Yeah, that's it. Look, we, I think we, we do a lot of work with trying to educate the girls. Um, and I say ed educate in a, in a kind of with a performance mindset on um, how to prioritize themselves, you know, to make sure that, you know, you know, we, we've contracted 30 girls this year, last year it was 19. And, and the main function of that is we noticed, well, we always wanted to increase, but um, we noticed that our non-contracted girls were the girls getting injured, <clears throat> which makes sense. You know, they're just not trained, not able to support themselves as much, etc. But we've had to do a lot of education, financial education with the girls around how to be kind of selfish and focused with your spend, you know, to make sure that, Although you can't share all of your um, your salary or your monthly earnings on your yourself, um, but equally by spending it on all of your family, um, without you being able to fuel your training, is not going to allow you to stay in the squad and therefore have a have a future in it. And the long term effects to your support and your family will be will be more positive. So, I think oh look, the girls are incredible, you know, and they're and hopefully. That those kind of lessons are, are starting to embed and you can see this like wonderful peer driven understanding of of that concept and those principles um and the girls are are really kind of taking ownership and so on for it but um but yeah i'm like i'm obviously not going to try and pretend i understand what it's like uh, but yeah there are some of the things that we have to to work with what was interesting when we had sarah bonnet on the pod is she just said they were so stunned and so impressed. Similarly, when Babalba did join them at Quinn's by the physicality and the ability to just absolutely get stuck in from the word go. And there's n like no holding back, no just kind of feeling it out, just seeing what everyone else is about. And that level of, um, I, I even sometimes get that feed feedback in a professional context, that level of directness. That is just, uh, I feel sometimes a little baked into us culturally as well. Yeah, do you know what? She's just such a special person. Emily, I don't know if you've managed to meet her yet. And I say this in, in a way, look, you know, loads of the girls are so special. And I think that the the brilliant thing about our game and like the Alliance League is that you have so many foreign um, cultures that are playing in it now. And I think that's such a cool thing to have. So any of the girls that come over, I think anybody in the UK is going to really enjoy just the, the difference and flavor and 
different cultures and so on. She's just a next level type of person. And, and for various reasons, I suppose, just how, how much context she has, um, how committed she is to higher purpose, um, how articulate she is to be able to articulate her points. I love how brave she is full stop, but how brave she is to, you know, she, she's no right at all to come to the UK and to be able to continue on the messaging from a South African context that she that she delivers all the time in South Africa. You could totally understand how she'd be overawed by who's there and try and conform to, you know, the English way and um, be so grateful for the opportunity, obviously, which she is. But I think within two or three weeks of her being there, she I, I saw a couple of clips of her delivering these really kind of powerful messages about her, her journey and um, Kailicho, obviously, where she was from and really trying to kind of role model what is possible um, and I thought that was really you know brave and grounded for her to have that kind of peace and, and space of mind to be able to bring that straight away to a platform and um, yeah she's a real smashing woman yeah really really pleasure to to work with and be around and then um we have to talk about the culture because there are so many if there isn't just one there is no one singular South African culture and you are in the middle and in the mix of so many different languages and so, so much in terms of backgrounds and where people come from. South Africa is a massive country. It takes 14 to 16 hours, depending on what it, how crazy you are, to drive between Cape Town and Johannesburg just for anyone who's never been. It is vast and a lot of these girls are from very rural parts of the country. And um, the Welsh girls, when we went into camp with them in the Vale, said their training session uh, with the South African girls was just out of this world because they rocked up late, they had their boombox, they were just vibing and dancing and singing, and it is just culturally, I'm, I'm sure, uh, a bit of a different kettle of fish for you, is it? Yeah, no, it's it's cool. Um, I will take responsibility for the rocking up late. I think I just got the time wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, but but no, it was it was it was cool. Look, I think there's obviously eleven different cultures in South Africa, and um, there's seven different cultures and languages, obviously within our team. I think what what I feel very excited about is one of the things I feel very connected to in in the women's game is really trying to ensure we can create an environment where, where females or anybody who's in it but but females to really feel like one they belong uh, two they are valuable and um, because one I think that that obviously will help them support them to grow as a person into whoever that is that they want to be but two at a performance level I think I, I very firmly see the link between confidence and performance confidence confidence and performance and I think that by creating an environment that where the girls do feel safe to be able to express who they are have conversations I need to hear what's going on in their brain from a rugby point of view and we need as a team to be able to hear that so that we can problem solve on the field you know so we did a lot of work last year of being able to try and encourage that and um, you know with with simple things like player surveys and and small groups and collaborative sessions and um really trying to create a culture whereby mistakes are encouraged and a part of learning as opposed to being punished by um and i think the effect hopefully of that is this year we have a group of girls that are just more confident in their own skin and realize how important it is that they bring themselves to the party and that is what's necessary in order for us to build as a team um, and I think the effect of that is, is that there is this kind of freedom of self-expression through song and boom boxes and things like there's just some small examples that that we've noticed. Like, for example, Elma, you'll, you'll know that in South Africa, obviously, bursaries, education bursaries are, are quite, a, you know, big things and important things. And we, we have the opportunity to to give bursaries through a, a kind of a rugby education charity that Saru started. Um, and last year we, we got some funding and I reached out to all the players, sevens and fifteens, to say, you know, there, there's some, some funding here. Uh, and they just had to submit a few things. So we had some funding and probably enough for 10, 12 players to fund, you know, courses for that year. Now they have, they, they would have had to be ready to 
pay, you know, so they'd have obviously had to pre-plan that they were starting the course that year. But literally one player in the whole of the two squads um, actually got the bursary because she was ready and she wanted to. This year, we've got 13, you know, we've got 13 players who are ready with their courses. They're like texting me all the time saying, you know, Lynn, when is those bursaries coming through? And I'm like, whoa, like, isn't that just a great example of just confidence and understanding of like your future, your importance, your value. So I think they're small things. And even other things like um, my players who are the player association, sometimes they'll come in obviously and do talks with the girls. And what they notice now is that the girls are asking questions and they're challenging them, you know, and I'm just like, I'm sorry, they're challenging you, but isn't that great? You know, that they actually have the confidence to speak up and say, Hey, this is not right and stuff. So hopefully that's been reflected in boom boxes and arriving late and uh, enjoying themselves but yeah I think that's that's hopefully a sign of a good environment I think it's definitely the sign of a good environment playing South Africa is one of to Elmer's point earlier one of the fit, most physical challenges but then on the other side of it almost one of the most uh, like welcoming environments even if they're you know you're playing them at home because of that bit after you know after the game the singing the dancing even though they know full well we cannot sing and we cannot dance they accept us as if we're you know some of the best movers that they've ever seen um and and i just love that it's one of you know they're certainly tough tough on the pitch and then just completely transform um off the pitch and i I love that about south africa i really do like i'm sure you girls will share this but like i'm not saying i'm i'm right either is like my thoughts on on performance is that we need we need people to be themselves don't we we need people to have the freedom to be able to push their boundaries and they're not going to do that on the field if they don't know who they are or be willing to explore that off the field um and to do that this is the environment we need to create i need to hear what's in your brain you know because I, that's you're a part of this team and if we can't bring you out onto the field then you can be anybody you can be a robot I, we need to hear that you know but to do that obviously it needs a good bit of kind of coaching off field and encouragement and a safe environment I think is really really key um, and then just some clever practicalities around you how you encourage it you know a lot of girls are going to feel or, or guys are going to feel a little bit daunted if they have to speak up in a group so there's ways around that look I suppose culturally we we really encourage the girls to speak in whatever language that they're they're comfortable in um, and we, and even our surveys we'd send out in, in a couple of different languages and uh, the girls are quite good at um at, like obviously translating for each other but something I've noticed this year and again I, I don't know if I'm wrong in this or not because there may be some girls that aren't in this boat but funnily enough I've noticed that even though kind of the common language that we communicate in is English uh, I've and, and some of our our, our staff are, are more comfortable in English in this in this batch what I've noticed is the girls are actually communicating more comfortably in their groups even in English. So I think previously I thought, or oh, maybe it's a, it's a language barrier thing, but I think it's proving to have been a comfort thing. Um, but, but we'll see, we'll see. Either way, you know, you know the kind of point I'm trying to make. It's crucial because men's rugby is very Afrikaans dominant, or used to be very Afrikaans, dominated by Afrikaans because the coaches were predominantly Afrikaans. And so even English speaking players like Bobby Skinstad have spoken about this for years and years, saying coming in as an English speaking guy, even though he's white, he really felt like he had to do everything in Afrikaans in order to get by socially, but also professionally in rugby. And um, someone like Sia Khaleesi has changed and challenged a lot of those stereotypes around language and the way culture is just reflected at every level. Um, And the women's game has culturally, historically always been Corsa because it's from the Eastern Cape and it's played um, so much more widely by women there than it is, I feel, sometimes in any other part of the country. So it, it has been interesting for me from the outside to try and see if there's there's any of that shift happening. I love that you are saying that you're reflecting language in so many different ways, but also seeing that um, a lot of people are finding it easier to just find a meeting place somewhere in the middle. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think this is actually a really important topic because um, we actually had a couple of calls today with HR. We're, um, we're trying to be proactive in this kind of, in this space of how do we create an environment that's one kind of, gender friendly and and inclusive and in that point obviously we're capturing all the kind of female aspects of the game that that we're aware of but this inclusive space around how do we create an environment that truly makes girls feel you know that they belong that they are valued the second piece is this 
cultural insensitivities piece and uh, like I don't know if you girls read uh, like the the reports that came out from New Zealand a year and a half ago and there's some, some reports and reviews done in Canada, Wales etc um, and I pulled them all together and was just really interested to see what came out and was there common themes and I think this cultural insen- insensitivities piece was key definitely in the New Zealand piece um, but I think what it touched on in the women's game is just a, a reflection that we still do administer rugby according to like a certain type of person don't we which yes is is usually male and a middle class and um from a, a first world country you know uh, but but we know that there's a lot more different people playing rugby now and in the in the women's game these cultural insensitivities that came out from a new zealand context are really really relevant and and i think even though that may not be the same in every country I think the point is is that we're we're trying to administer the game according to a certain type of people and there's a lot of other different types of people out there. So I think what we're trying to do is be proactive in recognizing from a South African context that like that's that's huge, absolutely huge, you know, and if we can if we can deliver the game in a way that's like culturally sensitive um and and appropriate and representative not only can the girls kind of define what their identity is and what does that look like and therefore kind of live it and breed it, but two, we're, we're kind of honouring, I think, where we need to go in the women's game, which is is, is recognised that it, it's okay if we redesign it a few different ways to make sure that people... And it's not just feel included because it's nice to feel included. I think it's important that people are a part of what we're doing because that drives belonging, that drives identity, that drives confidence, this confidence piece. And we know when you have got confidence, then, you know, the rest is history. So anyway, that's my monologue. <laughs> Does any of this ring true for you, uh, Skaz? Because I feel like there's so many ways at which this, like I'm constantly thinking about uh, Fee Thomas' uh, article in the, in the Telegraph and how, Lynn, you have been walking this parallel road from when you were still playing and the horror stories you guys had when you were still fully amateur. Um, but a lot of this work is still continuing in so many, many different layers. Yeah, like, em- Emily, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. And I think about this quite a lot, actually. You know, what's your experience of these things? You know, I- I'd hope that you-, you don't experience a lot of them. I know it'll be different in the, the levels of-, of your experience, but I'd hope in one of the most professional setups in the world um, that, yeah, that all of this amateurism store for whatever we're talking about here isn't showing up but yeah I'd be interested to know yeah look I think we're we're in a really good place at the moment with a lot of that stuff um but we're in probably in a good place because we've you know we've had to go through it and learn along the way as well I think obviously we were the first female team to go professional I think pretty sure um and therefore inevitably it wasn't going to be perfect from the start I think the, the biggest thing and you've just touched on it there and I think it was prominent in in Fee's article is you have to involve the players in what you're doing and you have to involve their thoughts, feelings, concerns, all of that sort of stuff, because ultimately they're the ones living it and, you know, continue to um, check in with them about stuff. Because, you know, when we uh, find it interesting when we spoke to Abby Ward around, obviously the pregnancy policy and stuff, and actually she's going to go through it, but it's been written kind of guessing she's going to go through it and we're going to rewrite it again based on actually what what it feels like for her what did work what didn't work etc and I think that has to be a process that that is followed throughout you know it can't be one size fits all it has to be a little bit adaptable to things and yeah as I say we we definitely didn't get it all right there's definitely been frustrations along the way but we're in a we're in a really good place with it now um and we're in a good place with it now because we've built those foundations and built the structures whereby now we can, you know, we can have those conversations, we can have meetings, we can have, we've got various subcommittees, leadership groups, etc., that can be consulted on various areas of either the game itself or, you know, things that happen off field. So, yeah, I think having player input is, is so important because ultimately, like you say, they're the ones that need the confidence. They're the ones that go and perform on at the weekend in the shirt and that then reflects back on, on everything else. Was there anything in that article, Lynn, that Fee Thomas wrote that surprised you about Ireland in 2023? No, no, look, it, it didn't surprise me. Um, but I do think that... I, I think that, and I've spoken to Ali Donnelly actually about this a few times, I think there's, there's been a lot of anger um, for a long time 
in the system and distrust and reasons for distrust. And there's a lot of stories. And I think these stories are, are just going to take time to come out. Um, it, it would be worrying if through that time nothing was changing or nothing was happening. Uh, and then there's cause for massive concern and more anger. Um, but if something is changing and there there is a there is a like a, a genuine attempt to turn the tide that that is important for us to recognize and and that build is huge um, and it's going to take some time but that won't stop the stories coming out because they're all valid and most people in the women's rugby community will have an example of them i think i think what's relevant is when it's so messy some of the examples are just examples of an amateur setup, you know, and not enough people working there and or, you know, are inexperienced and therefore don't know what they're doing and they're learning on the go and making mistakes and the experience for the players is bad. Um, and some of that stuff is just amateurism. Um, and then there's the female specific stuff. But I think when it's so messy, often people can't decipher between between both. And, you know, when it gets reported on, it's it's everything. And then people you know, from the outside in, we'll read it and say, well, like, what, what is this saying? And um, so, like, I think it is all valid. I think the message is that these stories are valid. Uh, they will come out for a few years and and the fault sits with the game. Um, however, I think I, I think the game is changing. You know, I do think there's a strategic commitment now. There's definitely lots of resources being put into it. As Emily says, I've no doubt they're going to trip and stumble and there'll be a million iterations of what that looks like. Um, but if there is that kind of strategic focus, then I think that's a positive thing. And Emily, you attested to it too. I don't think we've ever seen that before in, in my time. Yeah. For anyone who's missed the article, just for context, an anonymous player recently and potentially possibly still in the squad cited examples such as problem sourcing protein supplements prior to a tour, finding out uh, that they were being dropped via email, uh, failure to consult about the switch from white to blue shorts, as in players didn't, some players didn't know that this was happening until it happened, and an unwillingness to explore the option of hybrid contracts. Hybrid contracts, of course, something that we've discussed on the show for, for the last few weeks because it is relevant to the structure of how people schedule and plan and live their lives. Do go read it. There are replies uh, from the IRFU in there as well. Uh, where are we now with Ireland compared to the other unions in the Six Nations? Is this Ireland starting from scratch? Have they started? Yeah, I think I think they are. Look, I think it's it's the safest place to say, or it's the safest way to answer that is that is that they are. And I base that on two things. One is that you know, kind of without strategic commitment and without the right resourcing and without the, without the right people being employed in in positions of decision making and so on um they're always just going to keep fumbling across each other every every year so i think i think there is a a line in the sand um and therefore this is you know that that first step and um, as well as the fact that you know this is quite a a young squad for whatever reason now some of it's because they're trying to blood new players and you know that's another sign of just a, a rebuild etc whereas previously you would have had you know, the Claire Malloys and so on that would have been there and you would have expected more from the team because um, they have some really talented players there. Whereas the bones of this squad are are, are a development squad or on a development journey. And as a result, I think this is the place that they are. I think what's really relevant is they missed out on the World Cup and you'll have all of those other teams in the Six Nations that are, you know, three months since the last time they saw each other, for example, or like a, a maximum three months, uh, they've had a great experience over there, whether winning or losing. Either way, they're, develop they're developing and getting test rugby being global experience. And, and we all develop in, in World Cup cycles. Um, and that's, that's going to hurt them. That's going to hurt every, every country that, that misses that massive step. And that's why you never want it to happen again. Now, what's interesting for me is what Anna Kaplis said about the fact that she just wants someone to say, yes, we're dealing with this. We're going to do everything we can to make sure we eradicate any of these problems and behaviors. We're going to stand up for the players and say, yes, we're doing everything we can. Um, and just a positive posture of not necessarily defending, not necessarily saying that it's not happening, but rather going, here is what we're doing to solve it and acknowledge it. 
um and this is a this is um often the thing that i feel like do you know when particularly in the men's game when coaches start losing and they start saying thing and, and they start kind of really batting back any criticism and sometimes as a fan you just want them to go there's a problem here that like, we can see there are problems here people are unhappy there are problems we are listening and we're going to try and fix them and sometimes that's all an organization does need to do is to say like honestly we're not getting it right, but there is an, an effort and there is a whole team of people here committed to it. Now, having worked at my players, which you mentioned earlier, the players organization in South Africa, I also know very keenly how often and to what extent they would literally be murder on the dance floor in the boardroom, but in front of the kids, in front of the sponsors, in front of the media, we maintain really good, healthy relationships because you want to protect the commercial value of the mm. entity. You want mm. to ensure that it's it's a property that people want to sponsor and attach their brand to. It's um, a sport that children want to play and parents want their children to play and participate in. And there's this constant balancing act between how much are we going to drag each other around by the hair in the public domain and how much are we just going to sort this out behind closed doors for the sake of the greater good. Um, should there be a greater emphasis here on mending fences behind the scenes and really sorting it out? Or is what we're seeing constantly, well, it seems like it's a recurring theme, um, a, sy a symptom of the fact that there isn't enough of that happening? Yeah, and, and I think that's why it's it's really complex. I, I think you're right, communication is absolutely key. Um, I think there's no doubt about that this is damaging the game. You know, it's definitely damaging... Um, sponsorship opportunities because you know why on earth would you would you touch the game with this type of reputation and um, I, I do come back to that the stories are valid and if it if this is what people need to do in order to vent their frustrations and tell their side to um to people who they don't think are listening then 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 so be it um, and and I think the union are just going to have to weather, weather that storm for a while because it because it's reality um, you know what I what I really respect is last year, Kevin Potts, the new CEO, came out and said, and his response to some things was, you know, we can do better. You know, we need to do better. And I think that was a really good response. Now, I think, I think he he would be repeating himself again and again and again uh, at multiple examples because there are so many examples that that have come out. But ultimately, that's going to be re that has to be the response is, is that we can we can do better. Look, I, I think what I do know and, and what I've learned not only about South African rugby, I think it's the same across the world in all unions is that. And what I don't think unions realize is how much of a commitment there needs to be to the women's game. So, you know, you can say that we are strategically committed. We can have a strategic plan. You know, we can work on our board representation. And I don't understand that that takes time. But what does that look like on a daily basis at an executive level and how much of a commitment do we need from all of our execs to really turn this ship around? And um, what, what I believe is necessary and, and the, the positive outcome in our era is for women's rugby to be fully integrated into the organization. You know, we have so much IP in the organization in all of the departments, the commercial department, the finance department, HR, the coaching, refereeing, etc. Um, and they should just deliver rugby women and women's and men's rugby whereas often often it's like it's down to the the women's rugby representative or whatever so I, I think that type of strategic commitment is massive that true integration of the women's game into the org um where it's truly owned by everybody that actually delivers and responsible for it and I think that's the type of stuff organizations are still trying to understand you know I think they still see it as an arm of the game instead of no it's you know women's and men's game are, are the same and they need to be delivered kind of equitably so I, I think I think every every union is still on that journey of understanding what does that commitment actually need to look like Um. so yeah I think they need support in that and hopefully World Rugby would be able to kind of guide that but that's the yeah that's something that I think we're, we're not really um getting a handle on yet. Did you see that tweet in the week? And I, I can't remember who tweeted it, so I can't give credit for it. But they basically tweeted saying, wouldn't it be interesting if the Six Nations was a combination of results, i.e. So the men's competition and the women's competition aggregated out somehow, and then that produced a Six Nations union winner? And then wouldn't that make the unions basically really pump some stuff into their kind of their female teams and, you know, 
give it the the kudos it deserves etc i thought that was really interesting obviously it's not going to happen and i'm not suggesting it should happen but it just that tweet kind of made me smile and think yeah let's credit him his name is paul tyler at glasgow glasgow the six nation championship should be decided by the combined results of the men's and women's team they'd soon take the women's game seriously what a meaty prospect that would be i mean love it but it do you know what it is the it is the ultimate illustration of exactly what we're talking about is not to have the women's department women's rugby department fending for itself on all fronts and then have all of these um existing departments only looking after yes the goose that lays the golden eggs right now Hmm. but to be really progressive in forward planning for the geese that will lay all of the future eggs together in you know five or ten or fifteen or twenty years time because you have to take a really long-term approach by this because as you say it's not going to be cheap and initially it's going to hurt like hell because you are going to have to allocate resources equitably and that's that's a that's in south africa i feel like that's what you said earlier in South Africa, we understand that equitable allocation of resources does not mean we get the same amount. Yeah, look, I, I think there's so much in this. Um, it's kind of like the, the Title IX um, approach in universities in the USA, isn't it? Um, and there's something, I remember speaking to one of the Scottish guys, uh, and he spoke about, it's kind of like a pension fund or a savings fund. That's the women's game. He's like, if you if you don't invest in it now, you're absolutely screwed, you know, for the future. And that's how you should look at it. It's not that... You should never take your savings and feed your current account. Like everybody just knows that that's just silly, you know, but you, you have to obviously fund your your savings account to, to have a future. Yeah, look, I, I think um, I think the exciting thing that's going to happen in the next couple of years is football. Like obviously women's football, European football, English football and UEFA are just about, I think they're on their eight years of their 10 year. And if we talk about the 10 year of return on investment type of benchmark, but we've not seen it yet, you know, so no countries really or sports are kind of saying oh we can make money from this and we all know that when they do it'll be like bing 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 okay great you know and they see two revenue streams and not just one obviously funding two and i think that from a uefa point of view where you're knocking on the door of that return on investment probably in the next year you know after the world cup that type of thing and i think when and and, and we're you know from a, from a rugby point of view different unions obviously at different stages but we're probably, you know, what, four or five years down that journey and it's going to take another couple of years before that return on investment. But, you know, 2025, you set out tricking them for your World Cup final and before you know it, you're, you've are you got unions really saying, oh my God, this is possible. We can actually pay for gates and spectators and, and make money from this. So I think in the world, once that happens, and I, I'd imagine it's going to happen in the next two, three years, I think there'll be some big eyes open to see right okay so there is a return on this we really need to invest and that will be the carrot um but but let's see but i i suspect that's going to happen huh it has to be you like it's you don't need to be a genius to work out how much revenue the men are just using an rfu example the men bring in by selling out twickenham i don't know say three times the six nations and maybe a couple more in the autumn whatever we're so we're at fifty thousand, i think for the england france game which is unreal Ten pound a ticket. That is obviously you don't need to be a genius to work work that maths out. Obviously, there's some corporate um, hospitality stuff in that as well. But even if you you know put another fiver on that ticket price, to, uh, double it to twenty quid, it's still not horrific. Like it's the only way you can continue to make money. You can't make the men play any more games. You can't make Twickenham bigger, not drastically so. And I don't think you can increase the ticket price because it's already quite steep, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like it, it's a no brainer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the question I have for you, Lynn, uh, is I love that people like Zidle and Pupa last year for Exeter Chiefs and Babal Walacha this year for Harlequins are getting the opportunity to play over here because I am so excited about the South African girls getting the opportunity to play in the Allianz Prem 15s because it is objectively just a great place for individuals to come sharpen their skills and play against and with the likes of our scares not this season the position the irish rugby football <laughs> union has taken around contracts and the hybrid model is one that i cannot wrap my head around because yes the ail is not up to scratch yet and yes i understand the need to try and push it to become that but right now surely players 
should be allowed to play in the Prem 15s and be on an Ireland contract. That's what is yielding the results that you're seeing in Wales and Scotland. Yeah, that's it. Look, um, yeah, look, maybe it's an attempt to kind of reclaim, uh, not necessarily control, but it's kind of reclaim a, a grasp on their the direction that they want to go. Um, I, I, I'd imagine it's coupled with the, the plans for the Celtic League. Um, I, I would imagine the vision to have a provincial competition that's aspirational, that's feeding into some form of cross-border elite competition. Um, and ultimately, the where the development happens for those things is the fact that if they're full-time programmes, girls are in a daily training environment, training 20 hours a week plus, and and that's where your development comes from, etc. So I would imagine that the decision that was made around that was based on a future vision coupled with that those type of elite plans. Um, but I genuinely don't know that. What I do know, however, and I think this is a good example of where this is so messy and everybody is just so frustrated, is that it's so easy. And, and there's, there's probably such a lack of trust um, that it's it's very easy to just see the the negative side to to most examples, um, and I think what we do know is when the men's game went professional from amateurism, there was a lot of messy couple of years around contracts and players even sharing contracts and stuff like that. So I would I'd hope that it it works itself out, it evolves. I'd hope there's lots of discussions with other countries around good models, good practice and so on. Um, and I'd hope it's driven by people that are experiencing contracting and not learning as they go, you know, because I think that that's really, really relevant. You know, there's nothing that frustrates anybody more than when people start talking about messing with our own contracts and our own pay pay packet. Um, so, yeah, but but I appreciate that it's it's very kind of messy and frustrating at the moment. I have to wonder sometimes if it's that kind of deeply seated uh, sometimes also just need to be better than England at something <laughs> um, they're really stretching there aren't they um, <laughs> no look I've always I always found and again some of it was probably because I you know I played in England uh, etc but I, and this is probably a very uh, like th this comparison is probably not valid at all and it's probably not reflected if you ask an English person this but I always would have thought my relationship with English rugby was like <laughs> that's terrible even to say it was like Nadal, Federer, Djokovic era you know is that you, 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 you hated England for being so good but yet they made you better you know so you respected them so much because I do respect England so much they're, they're leading the way they're showing everybody what can be done, etc. Um, and you'd be a fool. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. But to, to not respect and, and like them. That was the approach that I always took. Uh, but some people are fueled by anger and, you know, get them. But <laughs> do you think that Nadal and, and Federer comparison, Emily, do you look at us like that? <laughs> I'll, ta I'll take it. I would definitely take it. <laughs> I think I'd want to be, oh, be Federer. Scared. I'd want to be Federer. Maybe oh, better. absolutely! She's the Swiss watch. <laughs> I'm the, you know, aggressive Spaniard. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So Did good. you really shit, Lynn? And she was just like, "Oh, I'm just gonna be cool back here." No, we had some amazing battles over the years. No, we did. Back in those, absolutely. I don't know what, what era would that have been pre 2014. For well, yeah, I got captain yeah. 2008. So until Linny retired in 2014. We had some yeah. amazing battles. It was always yeah, yeah. a lot of fun. I didn't realise you hated us, but, you know, I'll cop that one. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's what I'm saying. I respected you. It was total love <laughs> said. <laughs> Lynn, what did you need to watch out for when uh, you lined up uh, centre to centre um, against Emily Scarrett? Give us the give us the, the breakdown. Oh, God. It was just their, their wit, man. Like, their, the wit they put on the ball. Obviously, like, Katie was such a pivot the point. Wit. and the way they put and Emily and just her like her strike lines were just so good like she's obviously such a, a graceful player and skilled player and you know to watch her you think I 
can predict what you're going to do. You know, you're just you're just gracefully running into that gap. But when it actually happens right in front of your face and it's a steam train, you're like, oh, God, just like hold on and hope for the best. But no, I was always very lucky. We always had some good center partners with Jen Murphy and Grace Davids. So we, we tried our best and we worked hard to keep the hurry combinations down because that was with... Obviously, Burf was your 12, Claire Allen was there for a while. You always had some really, really great centre partners at that time. It was a really, really smashing competition. Uh, Scazzy, we need the same on in now. Come on. Oh, I mean, well, naturally, there's quite a a uh, height difference between the two of us, which always meant defensively, I was always s- terrified because obviously I, I never felt like I could be really offensive defending Lynn, not just because she's slightly shorter than I am, but also because she's got this unreal outside break and pace, which I never quite thought I, I was never quite sure I had the toe on her. Um, so just defensively, it was always passive. It used to drive me mad because it was always passive against her, um, which was always really frustrating, but no, she was quality. And as you say, that era, uh, you had Briggsy at the back, um, Miller on the wing, you had some, like you mm. said about us, you had some amazing people around you. It, back line to back line, always loved those battles and sparkles back in the day. Um, yeah, it was it was always a lot of fun. Just again, just trying to like play chess against one another. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? I want you here. She wants to go there. It was it was a lot of fun. And then Lynn, you were on the panel when Skaz won World Player of the Year in 2019. Yeah, definitely. Loved- you didn't stop this. <laughs> no 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 absolute pleasure no absolute pleasure look what i like about those panels is that they are i like this is another example of of women's evolution to be fair is that you know when when we were going around earlier well earlier whatever that means but and when it all kind of started you know these these people would be selected and, and players would be selected for these these rewards and who's on the panel is there anybody even watching those games etc so I really like that World Rugby have taken a step up and and following a really good process for that and I was lucky enough to be part of it but so it was very objective you know it wasn't just that I I, I liked my Federer and Nadal combination or that, <laughs> that uh, at all it was that she oh, look she's she's so she's very hard to not be impressed by like most years are a great year for Emily and uh, that year in particular was it was a smashing year so she was yeah head on head favorites we definitely have to have you on another time with some of the uh, ireland girls of old to just talk about the grand slam and the glory years and really relive and honor what you guys managed to achieve um i'm sure there are so many stories so the next time you're in london we'll get uh, the queen of leicestershire down here as well but before <laughs> we let you go i just want to take a moment for us to run through the predictions for round four this weekend ireland versus england musgrave park cork 2 15 pm on bbc2 if uh, you're in the kingdom uh, lynn cantwell what will be good enough here? Yeah, look, it's going to be hard to to take England down. You know, they're uh, flying on the crest of a wave, even though they're rebuilding as such, whether it's through injury or whether it's because they're rebuilding in a new cycle, um, they're they're firing on all cylinders. Um, Ireland are obviously coming from the back of three defeats and it's going to be a difficult one to, to kind of motivate themselves. Defensively, they haven't been showing up and hopefully that's something that they'll change. So it'll be a difficult day at the office, I'd imagine, and hopefully a strong first half just to set the tone for the second. Ireland face Scotland on the final weekend. Based on what you've seen until now, can we just quickly get a preview on that game? Could they take them? Yeah, a lot depends on what happens in the next two weeks. Um, and, and I think they can. Look, Scotland are a good side. And I think what they've demonstrated in their growth from the World Cup even to now is that they are, you know, Emily will remember Italy knocking on the door of some big wins for two or three years before they broke through. And I kind of feel like Scotland are that team at the moment. They're actually playing a really nice brand of rugby, some great talent, but they, they just get keep getting pipped on their on the line, you know, by by Wales or whatever team that they're playing. So I think it's only a matter of time where they kind of flip into the competitive and all they need for to do that is probably just some game strategy and some confidence. And I think the game against Ireland actually is an opportunity for them. Equally, I think if Ireland really, really knuckle down over the next two weeks, you know, close out all the noise and focus on their D and what they're trying to do in attack, I think it will be a competitive game. And, and I'd be hopeful Ireland really need to win that game because they need to 
qualify for that second tier of the WX 15s and otherwise you're going down into the third tier which is which is not where you want to be that's literally what I just wanted to, to ask about let's talk about WXV lots riding on Scotland v Italy and France v Wales it's interesting because Johan Cunningham has said that he thinks they prefer to actually be in WXV2. So be in that second tier and be the big dogs in the second tier instead <laughs> of going into the top tier and having to slug it out with some of the really big ones, um, which is an interesting approach. Um, what do you make of these two games, Skaz? Because that's, there's, a, there's an entirely different subplot here within the Six Nations where teams are actually playing with one eye on what's happening later in the year. I think his point, actually, just to talk about that first, is I don't think it's a bad one. I, th I think, like, you want to play competitive games where it's tight and you have to find ways to win or you have to overcome a challenge. Da, da, da. If you're beat, England beat them by, what, 50 points the weekend? If you're getting three or four of those on a tour, what are you really taking away from that other than... Maybe, I don't know, your captain trying to come up with different ways to inspire a team under the post, which, do you know what I mean? So I think I, I, I understand his point in terms of that. Um, but then there is the, obviously the argument you play against the best teams, you potentially develop a lot quicker. Don't know. Next few rounds, super interesting. Um, I think that Scotland-Italy game at the weekend up in Scotland could be, again, I think it's going to be a real test for both sides and a, a, a game that both sides need to win which, you know, obviously doesn't fit. But I think for both those sides, they need to win that game. Um, and then again, for, for Scotland, Ireland in that last weekend, a huge game, potentially Ireland's opportunity to get a win and potentially Scotland's opportunity to either get there first or to get potentially two, which would be huge for them in a Six, a six Nations. So, yeah, very exciting. Um, that last round, especially, obviously with the England-France game as well, always going to talk about that. Hopefully... What it was Nick Heath's ridiculous stat the other week. As soon as 50 are sold, it sells out. I'm still not convinced about this, but 50 is sold. So Nick, come on. No, apologies to Nick. I misquoted him. I <laughs> apologise to him in the week because I scrolled back on our text message history and he said he thinks it was actually more like 60. <laughs> uh, so I completely misquoted him when I said 50. But I'm kind of going, let's just keep selling tickets. Let, hit, let's hit 55, folks. Let's aim for 65. I mean, at this stage, you're going to see the sugar babes anyway. So whether you're even there for the rugby at this stage, there's going to be 50,000 other people who are going to be there for the rugby. Bring your mates bring your cousin bring your friend i'm literally bringing cousins and um, that's 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 the level we're at um and we're we're having branches and lacranches all of it together on the same day which i mean it's unbeatable really when are you heading back to the southern hemisphere lynn um well we're here for a while yet actually so i'm um i'm pregnant and i'm i'm due in probably about six weeks so um yeah we're staying here for that and for the delivery of that and for a bit afterwards so yeah <laughs> Exciting! So good. Here's my big bob. That's brilliant. Oh, <laughs> congratulations, Lynn. Oh, thank you. Love that. So you're in the Northern Hemisphere for a little while then. And yeah. we have not even, guys, I can't believe we've been doing this. And we have not even talked about this. The kicking. Scaz. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the kicking. Oh my goodness, your Instagram story game is absolutely <laughs> off the hook. We're living for this. Um, but also, uh, do you know that the Hannah O'Connor versus Emily Scarrett forwards versus back kicking challenge video is still on the internet? No way. So I thought I would just put that, that out there That was nearly a very well. embarrassing day for me. <laughs> so here for us to talk about women who are amazing kickers um so go find that video uh, but also just um loving the fact that there is there is an unparalleled amount of talk about women on the kicking tee at the moment any comments you would uh, you would care to drop here um emily scarrett while we've got you i think mids is just dropping bombs before he leaves he's got however many two games left <laughs> <laughs> he's just throwing them out there i said to him at the weekend i saw him caught him after the game and i said oh what what are you going to what controversy are you going to erupt this week this week then i'm a kicker and i want to still keep kicking from wherever the try is scored but I understand that he was trying to protect the girls, etc. A lot been made of the injuries we've got. Potentially four of your kickers are not in the squad right now. I think the, the biggest thing and probably the reason for saying it is the kickers at the top level are, are completely good enough to hit that. But the, the depth and the consistency of that is 
is probably the bigger thing and and that comes from young girls kicking a ball regularly when they're growing up like boys do and and it just happening much more so now but i was the complete anomaly growing up amongst my group of girlfriends i was the only one that kicked a ball i was the only one that played rugby i was the only one that was remotely interested in going and playing football with my brother and his pals um and i do think that is definitely changing now but um that that i think that's the biggest thing we've got to get more girls comfortable kicking from an early age because then it just it transfers so much more easily um but yeah what a fun controversial week we've had (laughs) one thing i did reflect on at the weekend actually is one good thing about the women's game is that every time a penalty is given away on the halfway line or even into the other opposition's half or sorry your own half we don't just point for post the whole time and that is something that's really i think good about our game we go to the corner you play a bit more whereas sometimes the men's game especially in those tight games it can get a bit of a penalty fest which don't get me wrong the skill in itself is a phenomenal one but kind of it's kind of unique to our game i think which is quite quite a nice thing love that lynn thank you no problem oh guys this was amazing it was really enjoyable to see you both and chat really really cool i think we've now all uh, agreed that we want lynn to run the irfu and be the the president um like jacinda arden she's she's pregnant in the post at the moment uh when you're done uh, with the the other green team and you've changed south africa for the better then you know uh can't wait to see you uh, keep changing the world for the better. Oh no, thanks for having me on girls. And it's uh, it's an ecosystem approach, isn't it? We're all important to pull up our sleeves and, and make this change. And I, I feel like very lucky that we're in this era um, because I think there's a lot of change to be had. And that's not taken from other eras because I, I firmly believe you know, there's there's women like us in every era, you know, that are battling and fighting and see see the value in, in progress. They just weren't in an era that made the strides. But I think we have a real opportunity in this one. So I'm glad to be glad, glad to be in it with you all. Next time you don't need your Buzz Lightyear headphones, we'll welcome you to the studio with coffee and nice soft seating. We've been The Good, The Scars and The Rugby. The Good, The Scars and The Rugby is a Folding Pocket production produced by Shara Kilgallen. Mm-hmm.